After the Belgian car meet on Sunday, questions were asked about race director Michael Mazzi's ability to fulfil his role, a role that he was thrust into following the sudden death of Charlie Whiting in 2019. And a lot of people on the internet were saying, just do this, just do that, do this, it's not difficult, but there are so many different external factors at play besides just running a race. There's sponsorship, TV schedules or schedules if you want to debate the pronunciation of that, and fans that had paid quite literally some money to be there. And one of the most common comments on my last video was, just hold it on a Monday. Even though I said in that video, getting a whole team of marshals found, registered and trained within 24 hours isn't possible because while Monday was a bank holiday, you know, a public holiday for us here in England and Wales, that wasn't the case on the continent. A lot of those marshals would have been at their day jobs on Monday. But, you know, just hold it on a Monday, SMH my head. Needless to say, Michael Mazzi has a difficult job. A very difficult job. And he was being groomed to replace Charlie Whiting when he retired, and he's having to take on the job as director of the most money-heavy motorsport in the world, with not a lot of training in the grand scheme of things. Whiting had over 20 years experience. Mazzi has... Three. In Formula 1 that is, but we'll explore all of that in a little bit. So then, how would a YouTuber who has never done a race in his life and only ever raced pro racing drivers in a glorified video game have done things on that fateful day? Obviously this is just a bit of fun and nothing to be taken super duper seriously and it probably proves a point at the same time that the job isn't as easy as we think it is or make it seem from behind a phone screen on Twitter. So we need to first look at the weather. It was obviously raining and a heavier rain band was coming in, which would have seriously limited racing as we, you know, saw. But the way I would have done it is to do what they did in the actual race, and I'm using the term very loosely of course, delay the start and then see what that rain band does. As we've seen in the past, the weather can change quite suddenly in that part of the world. So if you see a change in that heavier rain band, then let it arrive and do its thing, and then evaluate the situation again. Maybe every half an hour or something like that. I would have also made the grid do the formation lap and the formation lap only behind the safety car and then let the drivers make the decision on what is best. Because after all, the drivers are the ones driving the cars and they are the ones that need to be able to see where they're going. And the ones you ask first are Hamilton, Alonso, Raikkonen and Vettel as they're the most experienced and the most successful as well as pole sitter Max Verstappen. If more than 10 of the drivers say no, then you're not racing. And as harsh as it sounds, you've got to say sod the fans at this point, because if someone Lando's it at Eau Rouge again, you've got Spa 1998, Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. And then what happens if you have 12, 13, 15 cars not being able to take a restart? There's no spare cars these days, and then you have a 5 or 6 car procession for a restart if it does come. And then you have Indy 2005, Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. And this actually happened in Australia in 2017 in the V8 Supercar Series there. You know, Touring Car Series, I say Touring Cars, it's more like Oscar. It's, it's, it's NASCAR, but with downforce, isn't it? On the second lap of the first race that weekend, Fabian Coulthard hit Rick Kelly on the exit of Turn 3 that made Garth Tander slow up, and then he was hit unsighted by Cameron Waters. There was then a chain reaction that involved Tim Blanchard, James Courtney, and Will Davison and Simona Di Silvestro, and Taz Douglas, James Moffat, Nick Percat, and Scott Pye, Alex Rulo, Tim Slade. A third of the grid. The sounds you could hear on that afternoon, to quote Neil Crompton in a different race, was the sound of cash registers ringing. There was a total of over a million dollars done, you know, Australian dollars that is, in damage and the teams agreed to abandon the V8 running and award no points. So it's happened in other series and you could argue a precedent set by that series that you might be able to use as ammunition for this if need be. Oh, and the deputy race director for that day working under Tim Schenken? Michael Mazzi. So with the formation lap done, no actual racing laps have been completed. The drivers have had time to survey the situation and make their decision on what is best. And as we saw in the closing stages of Sunday, the track conditions were okay. They weren't great, but they weren't awful, they were just okay. It was visibility that was the problem. And the medical car driver and the safety car driver both said, yeah, the track's fine, but the spray and the visibility will be the issue. And that is why 
it got stopped. And like I said in the previous video, what do you have? Do you have pottering around behind the safety car to satisfy a checkbox that says a race has been completed? Or do you let them loose and take bets on who wipes out first? I wouldn't have stopped the time limit clock either, and that's there for a reason. It was to avoid what we saw at Canada in 2011. Let that clock run. If it expires, it expires. And while there was the we did everything we could to put on a race excuse, if you want to call it that from the FIA, it's clear that from about 90 minutes into that stoppage, there wasn't going to be a race. The rain got worse, then you've got to be able to clear enough of the water to allow the drivers to race while still being able to see. Again, the track might have been fine when they were out there by themselves, but the spray is what messes them up. If they can't see, they can't race. You can clean all the water you want off the track, but for as long as it's still raining, then the amount of racing you can do is limited. So I'd imagine you'd get put in a lose-lose situation, but by at least two hours into that stoppage, I'd have made the decision. Race abandoned, no points, consigned to the history books as the race that never happened. And maybe look for a rescheduling later in the year. But you know, going to Spa in November really isn't a good idea because it snows. Then there's the issue of refunding the fans, but in this scenario I'm the race director, that's not my job. That's down to the commercial rights holders and the circuit owners to sort behind the scenes. It's like I heard a traffic cop say once on one of those you know, police camera death, whatever it's called. There was a guy he pulled over and he said, well, the, the, you know, the usual thing that usually happens, it's like, why don't you go after real criminals like robbers and racists? And the cop just goes, I'm a traffic officer, I don't deal with robbers and rapists. Unless they're in a car. And then once I made that decision, I'd probably resign out of shame. <laughs> like I said, it's a lose-lose situation, and it was from the very start. And like I said, Mazzy has an unbelievably difficult job. I support the decision to abandon the race. I don't support the logic and the way they went about it. Listening to drivers and what they think is what they should be doing first, rather than going, oh yeah, it looks a bit wet out there, doesn't it? You know, as we saw Vettel on Saturday when he saw Lando's crash and went, what did I say? What did I say? The red flag should be out. I've probably made a total hash of this, which I guess sort of proves a point in a way, like I said at the top of the video. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. 99.99% .99 of us don't. And it's very, very easy for one of us to sit here like I am doing right now and upload it to YouTube or you know, on your phones on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and all that stuff to say, just do this, just do that. But saying that, I think it would be really interesting to have a fly on the wall documentary type thing of what the race director has to do over the course of a race weekend. It'd be better than that sensationalized drive to survive bollocks, but I'm old and I'm grumpy. But let me know what you think down in the comments about how you would have solved the problem of the Belgian Grand Prix. See if you can be realistic about it. I'd genuinely like to see what ideas you can come up with beyond just do this, just do that. So, like I say, leave any comments down in the comments section. If you're new here, you know, subscribe with the bell on to get all the latest, and obviously like the video if you think I've made some good points. Massive thanks as ever go out to the good folk of Patreon, and if you want to join them, join in the Discord chat, or follow me on social media and all that kind of stuff. I'll leave all the relevant links down in the description box for you. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.